Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the last session of the day here on track four. My name is Sheena Wyatt. I am indeed a Cape Crusader for your personal brand and super coach for your business. It says so on my badge. Um, I am the chair for today's session. Um, what I'm going to do is just give you a very quick intro. And I'm also going to ask you to get digital with me. Um, we've got lots of great people in the room. Why not get LinkedIn up, running, and turn on your find nearby feature and link up with people here with us in the room. You're not here to listen to me today. You're here to listen to these two fabulous people. You're going to be hearing from Adam and Tobias this afternoon. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Adam, who's going to talk first. Cool. All right. OK. Um, thank you very much for coming to the last session of Learning Technologies, otherwise known as the Graveyard Shift. I know that there is a drinks reception after this. Of course, you probably want to get away. So me and Tobias will make sure we are as entertaining and as insightful as possible. Um, so good afternoon. My name is Adam Harwood. I'm the head of learning development at D&D London. So D&D London are a hospitality group that own luxury restaurants in uh, Manchester, Leeds, London, Paris, and New York. Now, I've been in this role for about six months. So I'm not going to talk about what I'm doing in this role right now. I'm just going to talk about my story and talk about my learning learnings about performance support and the impact it can make in organizations. Um, and it has been one of lots of potential. I, I think hopefully my story will resonate with you as well. The one thing I want to point out is that L&D, as we know already, is full of buzzwords. All you have to do is go down to the kind of exhibition floor and you'll see buzzwords, jargon and everything else. But the first thing to point out is that we've all used performance support in some way. Um, this could be anything from a post-it note you've got on your desk. It could be a process flow, a checklist, a cheat sheet, anything that's helping you in the moment of need in the flow of work. That's the idea. Of course, you could even classify this guy. Remember this guy? Super annoying. <laughs> but you can still say he was performance support. That was Clippy, by the way. Rest in peace. No longer with us anymore. Um, and he would interrupt your workflow and occasionally come up with distracting information you didn't need at that time. My point is this. We've all used performance support in our work, and we probably already do already. From a, le a learning and development perspective, if you, who, uh, hands up if you saw Bob Mosher's talk earlier on. OK maybe about half the room. Um, great talk, uh, and hopefully it won't be a repetition of that. It will be complementing it. Uh, but I want to say something that he mentioned as well, that performance support has been around in learning and development for quite a while as well. We have to go back as far as when Brian Adams was number one in the charts for about eight weeks in 1991 when Gloria, uh, Gloria Gary released Electronic Performance Support System. You can even tell by that book front that it's quite dated now. But of course, the idea and the discipline and the, uh, the mindset behind it all made sense to us. And in 2010, Bob Mosher and Conrad Goffison released this fantastic book that I personally dog-eared from, uh, from page to page because it essentially was a new way of thinking at the time. And it unpacked this idea that Training isn't just in the room, it's beyond that as well. And that's what Bob Mosher was talking about today, making sure that our responsibility isn't just in a room when the door closes. We've got a lot more to do beyond that to impact performance. Over the last decade, performance support has taken on new names. And once again, it's something we like to do in learning, development, learning and development is give it new snazzy titles. What I would say, though, is that these uh, terms that you're probably more familiar with, they're, they're a lot more broad up because, of course, the tools we have now, the technology, but also they're a lot more accessible. Because one of the things that I will try and position when I tell you about my story and my journey is that a lot of our role, and I know because I've worked in-house my whole career, is convincing stakeholders that this is the right way. Because in this room, we pro can probably all acknowledge that we know that workflow learning is where it's at but it's about getting your manager or the CEO or someone else on board with that approach as well. So these phrases here are a lot more accessible. But Josh Bursin says this, and I agree with him. I really do. I think that um, essentially um, it is where the world is going, and it's something to get excited about. And loosely, if I'm going to give a definition of it right now, I believe learning, and de learning development can make a difference if we get closer to the point of work and that moment where someone needs us to be. 
Now, uh, David James, um, a good friend, mentor, and host of the excellent Learning and Development podcast, recently released a white paper, I'd recommend that you download it, called L&D at the Point of Work. Now, this is, for me, my favorite quote um, that really unpacks and defines what I think this is all about, this whole approach. So it's guiding and supporting an individual when they need our help in the precise context in which they're expected to perform without them leaving workflow. There's a couple of key things there. Context is really important. I think Bob Mosher said it again in his session earlier. It's hugely important. It's not about throwing content at your people. It's about putting, putting in front of them useful contextual stuff that will really help them with the job. One thing David also states in this white paper as well is that learning at the point of work or this approach in general is one of the biggest missed opportunities in learning and development. And I would strongly agree with him. However, I had to go through my own journey to see it myself. Um, now, my career, I'm now at a hospitality brand. I started in tourism. I've gone from there to retail, to, to fintech, to fine dining. So I've been around the block a little bit when it comes to different roles in different organizations. The one thing that remains the same is people still need our help and usually need it, need it in the same type of way. Now, I can say that my journey started at Thomas Cook. Rest in peace again. Um, they are, of course, I love them, I love working for them, and I was that guy. Similar to now, in a way, the guy at the front of the room, Jazz Hands, the trainer. I was training holiday reps on how to give good service and how to sell you guys when you come on a package holiday, that camel safari that you didn't want to go on. All right, that was my job. I was getting them all G'd up and all motivated, and they were loving it. I was getting eight, nines, and tens on the happy sheets, and they were saying things like this. <laughs> And honestly, I was like, okay, this is, this is great. I'm in my element here. And I really thought I was making a difference. And I assumed that happy learners equaled performing holiday reps. Bef Q, the biggest wake-up call in my L&D career at the very start, that wasn't always the case. Because what happened was they got to resort. That's not me, by the way. That's someone else completely different. Um, they got to resort, and these were the type of comments that managers would throw back at me, usually over email or even in conversation. Your training didn't fix my team. Your induction should be longer. They're not good enough. Who's, who else has experienced these type of comments when they've done a training session or program, whatever? OK, that's all right, because it's not, <laughs> not just me. Um, now, as a trainer at the time, I didn't know a lot of this stuff about performance support, workflow learning, et cetera. I felt quite helpless, a little bit confused because I was getting a positive reaction. And there was a few things that I could know for sure. They showed up. Yes, they did. They liked it. Yep, I could tell they liked it. But the one thing I didn't know was, was it making a difference once they left the training room? And for me, I realized quite quickly, it's not about how much someone knows, it's about what they do. That's all that the, the the, the bosses and all the board and everyone who really focus on performance care about. It's a care, it's care, they care about what that person can do. And for me, I realize that's the most important thing. It, it's not about when that training door opens, it's about when it closes. So I took that and the fire in my belly was quite strong still because I was like, okay, I recognize that my role isn't just in the training room, it's beyond that. And in my next role, I went to a high street brand called Ted Baker. You may have heard of those guys. And I was only there a short period, um, but I was on a change project. And essentially the idea is that Ted Baker were gonna take out all of their old teals and replace them with new ones. And the idea was they were gonna train everybody across all of the estate on this is our new system, this is how you do it. Now this is at the point where I was getting a little bit more geeky and a bit more versed on what L&D was all about. So I knew about things like 70, 20, 10. I was obsessed with this idea of learning transfer. Um, I kept on quoting Ebbinghaus for getting curve and saying, if you just do training, people will just forget and they need to have stuff after that. I was telling everyone this, all my stakeholders, etc. Unfortunately for me, and I, oh, by the way, that was six years ago at Learning Technologies. I was that passionate about it. I went on camera and talked about it. But my execution and my ability to transfer what I felt 
belt and my passion and my knowledge to my stakeholders to believe and let me run with it um, fell short. And I didn't get that opportunity. And what I was what I was trying to propose was that this new system that they had to learn was that there would be videos that showcased um, the screencasts on how they do things from like keystrokes, etc. I thought it was a good idea, but unfortunately the main project lead on that uh, project said, no, we're just going to give them the booklet after training, the booklet. Yep, that happened. And for, for me, so I walked away from that feeling once again like, okay, I recognize that learning transfer is important. I know this stuff. But I don't know how to execute it. I need to convince my stakeholders even more. So once again, I went down the road um, to ASOS. Uh, and for me, this was really where I started to find my groove, if I'm honest. Um, but once again, I, I feel like I'm a little bit like putting pictures up of myself is a bit weird. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, sorry about that. But the, I wanted to click because you can see what I look like here. But what I'm trying to say is I was pretty glum when I first got there. And hopefully that depicts me not looking too happy. Because what I witnessed within my first few months at ASOS, uh, I promise that's the last picture, by the way, uh, was that it was very much the same as what I'd experienced in my early careers at the likes of Thomas Cook and Ted Baker, is that it was all workshops, over-reliance on the classroom and programs. And what was really weird about all of this was that ASOS are a digital brand. Their whole setup and their whole mandate is that they're, they're trying to zoom in on the 20-somethings and meet the, the consumer at the point of need. So I thought if there's any, any organization I work for that's ripe for performance support, it's going to be these guys. And it wasn't like that at first. And once again, I, we had a big training curriculum and offering and a program. And we used to offer um, appraisal training for managers who needed to be equipped on how to run a good performance review. Uh, and I will give you now the verbatim stuff that I used to get when we used to offer this, this training course. Um, I'll just look online. I can't make the workshop. I only need to know one thing. And can you send me the slides? Once again, around the room, have you heard that before? <laughs> again, well, it's not just me. That's good. Um, for me, I, the reality was that these were the type of things that were coming through, but I knew that managers still needed help with this because they were asking questions over email. We realized that they weren't actually effectively delivering these appraisals because we got feedback from the staff that were receiving the appraisals. So managers still needed help, but that was happening. So I was like, okay, what's going on here? And at this stage, guys, this is where I had my pivot because for a long time in learning and development, Training, workshops, and programs have always been at the tip of our sword. And we've always thought about performance support as something we add on after, when in reality, it's the shift we need to make that we need to start with performance support and then potentially supplement it by training. And I think that was something that was endorsed by Bob Mosher today. And I'm pleased to tell you that it's something that I've really tried to drive forward and I've seen some great results from it. So what happened as a result of that? Um, and the reason maybe I had that pivot moment was based on one question and one piece of research. And I'm going to ask you that one question just now, and I want you to be honest. What will you do if you need to know something or how to do something for your job today? So think about that question. I'd like you to, to speak to the person next to you and be honest about what would you do if you need to know something or you need to do something for your job today. All right, I think that might be enough time. I think that might be enough time. Um, shout a few at me. Google it, Google it. yes. Anyone else? Ask someone. Ask someone. YouTube. Mind Sorry? Mind yep, like it, Mindsaurus. <coughs> Just figure it out. Just figure it out, yes, I like it. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, um, it's no surprise because I've asked that question to people in rooms like this, stakeholders, trying to convince them about thinking differently. And I'm pl pleased to show you this, that this is kind of what backs up the question I asked you. This is a study from a learning provider called Degreed. Um, this came out in 2016 at the height of my pivot moment. It actually got re-released in 2019, very much similar research. So let me just break down for you because I think this really resonated with me and I hope it does for you as well, is across the top, you've got the frequency of interaction. So from daily right through to yearly. 
And what I want to draw your attention to, first of all, is hopefully this laser works. No, it doesn't. Uh, <laughs> you've got the daily and weekly space here. That's us in this room right now, that every single day and every single week, we are web searching. We are Googling our way through life. When a challenge comes along, it's usually we're jumping on search, we're finding something to the problem in hand. We want to stay in workflow. We don't have to leave to go somewhere to get the answer. It's the quickest and easiest way. Towards Maturity uh, did a study once that showed why, why, what the most effective learning is. It's because people want to learn faster and better. And it's because we know that the fastest result is you being, being able to search for, for what you need. Also, we rely on peer interactions. There's nothing easier, and I'm sure you had this in your office probably this week even, is someone turns around on their chairs and asks, how do I do that? How do I formulate a cell in, in, how do I formulate a cell in Microsoft Excel? Or how do I do this on PowerPoint? We are constantly asking people, we're watching others, and finally, videos. Someone shouted YouTube. The idea that we can go on YouTube and watch an instructional video, watch an inspirational video, watch an interview, whoever it might be, you can learn to build a house on YouTube. There's, that's where our people are pretty much every day and every week. However, the formal L&D touch points that are our bread and butter, where a lot of our budget goes, are in this space down in the kind of monthly, quarterly and yearly. Coaching and mentoring is quite close. I would challenge if all of your employees are being coached and mentored, and it is powerful. I don't want to be come across as this guy who is, is saying classrooms are bad, but I'm just making a point that this is where your people are, with or without you. They are operating in that space daily and weekly. And for me, and I th think this is where I want to be positive and be optimistic, is I believe the point of this is that this is the point of work. These guys don't stop to learn, they pause, they grab, they get, they move on with the task in front of them. And I believe we, L&D, can operate over there more so. And I also believe as well, the further we get away from there, the less difference and the less impact we can make. And I don't know about you guys, but I would much rather operate in that every day and every week than the every now and then space. So if you apply that, and my discoveries and my moments of like clarity of going, oh my God, this is a good opportunity for me to like try something different and experiment. I did exactly that. So when that, those appraisals came back around, I said, nah, we're not gonna run courses anymore. And I asked my manager, and again, you need someone who trusts you to try something different. Can we do something different with performance reviews? And because we, we, we were just going through the same old motions, delivering workshops over and over again. So. We did, rather than run courses, created and shared online on-demand resources that provided support and guidance for managers to and answer their questions at their point of need. Now, the one thing I want to point out that each one of this wasn't just content. Each one of these resources were contextual to ASOS and that specific situation. If you go back to the David James quote at the start, it's all about context. You can't just throw content at people. We already know that our people are Googling every day. We already know that. But the one thing you can't fight, and the only way you can beat Google, is if you put context in front of your people. You can go on there now, and you can Google how to do a good appraisal, and you'll get thousands of things. If you go on there and go, how do I do a good appraisal ASOS, you're not going to get anything. That's what it's all about. If you can serve up contextual content that's useful for people, specifically to the organization and the role they're doing, then you're winning every single day. And I've got to be honest, the approach, we launched this outside of the learning management system. It was a soft launch, and the feedback was great. Honestly, it, what, what it, it turned around from people going, this is amazing. Give us more of this stuff. From people not turning up to workshops, saying they don't have time, to saying, yes, I want more. Give me more. And we, we've, never run this, we've never run this type of approach previously at the organization. And what it showed to me was that they were ready for this. They were doing this anyway. They were just waiting for L&D to catch up with them. The appetite was already there. And the power of point of work learning was living and breathing through this. And I, I remember the best bit of feedback I got. And I felt like it was the moment of like, ah, this stuff really works. And it's all about performance support was this guy. Saying, thanks, Adam, I was looking at the resource on my way to the appraisal. Don't forget, we're not taking people off work. You're trying to help them while they're in work. They don't have to pause, they don't have to stop, they don't have to come off the, go to a different classroom, wait three hours to get information they don't really need. They can jump, grab, go, and do. And that's the idea. And the reason I believe it was so successful is because there was no gap between the challenge and the moment of apply. 
There was no gap at all. It was just straight in. Now, I'm not advocating no training whatsoever, but I think start at this place and then maybe add training after, if you need to. Bob Mosher, um, the godfather of performance support, I was delighted to see him today and I had a good chat with him after this. And I'm a bit nervous if he is in here. I'm not sure if he is or not, but if he is, uh, it's amazing. Um, he talked about um, his five moments of need earlier on. And the, the, the thing that Bob says is that we should start designing for the moment of apply and in the context of work. And the one thing I saw one of his talks previously, I was praying and, uh, that he wasn't gonna mention it today just in case it was repetition of what you saw earlier. And he asked a question uh, to the audience. And I think it was really profound, really interesting. He asked this, do you teach your people to swim or prevent your people from drowning? I think it's really interesting. Now, I don't, I'm not gonna try and dig into that. I'm just gonna show you an infographic that I think paints the picture even better than what I could say. You may have seen this before. It's been doing the rounds a few, few years in L&D now, but I think it's so relevant. And I think that this guy, we, what we tend to do is we tend to just throw loads and loads of information at our people. And sometimes, they'll forget it, well nine times out of 10 they'll forget it, they don't have time for it, or they just don't need it. All they need is that life support. They need that. And I think the, the way that we understand what our people need and that we're, how we can build for the moment of apply is truly understanding them. It's exactly what Bob was saying earlier. Get under the skin of what their role looks like. Understand what their challenges are. What is their friction points? What are the questions? What's, what are the questions that they need answering so they don't drown? What is their life support that you need to help them with? Let me give you an example that's hopefully contextual that will make sense because I want to kind of come out of this theory and jump back into the world of ASOS. Now, I knew that this approach was working. It seemed to be working for the appraisals. I thought, okay, one of the biggest things that people mostly need help with is transitions. If you're going to help anyone, help new managers, help new, new starters that are coming into a role and they don't know anything. They're kind of like, oh God, what do I do? Who do I speak to? Now, by a show of hands, can you tell me um, who's aware of managers who've had to wait weeks, months, or even years for development after they've been promoted? Okay, I want to say that's maybe half the room. Now, th that's quite common, right? Um, because what tends to happen is because we're operating with training first and the idea of how many, how many people can we fit in a room, we have cohorts, we have all these logistics of getting people, how much space there is in a room. But what tends to happen is this, hi, you're a manager, well done, uh, you've got a lot to learn, a lot to think about, how about you come on our management development course three months from now? That's, that's not on, we need to help your pe you need to help your people from day one. And at ASOS specifically, they needed help because they were drowning fast-paced organization, promoting people left, right, and center. And these guys were at, at fear of not passing their probation. They needed, they needed know-how from day one. So I'm gonna ask, um, I'm gonna show you now the type of questions that our new managers were concerned about when they first started. Um, and again, this is all contextual. So when you go back to your organizations, show them that degree of research and find out what are your manager's questions that they're worried about when they first become a new manager. And what we did, we got them in a room and we asked previous managers, what was concerning you when you first started? What were the big things you were worried about? And these are the type of things they told us. What do I do first as a manager? What might surprise me as a new manager? What questions might I be asked? What's expected of me? Now, if you think about that, if that is something that people are concerned about in their when they first become a manager, imagine waiting three months to find that out when you know that if you could serve up resources that are contextual for their moment of need, you can answer that question straight away. And of course, the classic one, how to deal with tricky uh, conversations. So once again, applying that logic, speaking to our managers, understanding what their deep end looked like, understanding the friction, the questions, and all of that sort of stuff, what did we do? We built resources that helped people, and we automated them. So we, we didn't want to make our managers wait. Imagine you're a manager at ASOS, you get a ping into your email saying, welcome, on day one, you are a new manager. Here's some stuff that will really help you get up and going. We wanted to help them keep afloat because we knew that we couldn't get them in a training room and they'd have to wait for about three months before they got any insight. But the big thing was, guys, these were all contextual. 
it wasn't just like, here's a load of content, because we know that if you Google leadership, there's a hell of a lot of stuff you don't want your people to see. We wanted, under, we wanted to get under the skin of what, was, what did a leader need, not just a leader need in general, a leader need at our organization. And we put our best people in the spotlight. And we asked them and we said, hey, okay, what might surprise you as a manager? Do you know what? Who knows that best? Other managers have that been in that position. To provide, get them to provide insights and know-how. And we embedded it in workflow and it was automated. So that means it was, it was built into bots. So it came through emails, it came through Slack, et cetera. So people had it in their hands when they needed it. They didn't have to wait. I'm gonna take a breather. <laughs> I'm talking too fast. Um, I was gonna give you my wrap up reflections um, and tell you that this is my takeaways from all of this, performance support, whatever, we, whatever you want to call it, workflow learning, learning in the flow of work, whatever, here's my big reflections. And I extend the invitation to you that I feel like I've been through it, had the challenges, tried to convince stakeholders. So if you want to reach out to me, LinkedIn, Twitter, I'm more than happy to sit down with you and talk for you how you can do it in your own organization. But first of all, um, performance support is not a thing. It's not something you're gonna buy on learning technologies as a vendor, you need to, it's a mindset shift that we all need to have. And you're not gonna convince everyone at first, so find the people you will convince, get them on board and try something with them. They are, don't forget, your people are doing this anyway, we just need to catch up with them. And don't, if you wanna be in the space that operates daily and weekly, don't build training first, build that later. Build the resources first and maybe supplement it with training. And if you really want to build stuff that's actually useful and get people are going to look at and they're going to engage with, do it from their perspective. Get them in a room and ask them. Put some post-it notes up and think about what the question, what questions would they type into Google if, if, if there was an internal Google? And my final point, this approach, people will go in this room, don't have time for that. If you don't have time for that, you're too consumed with training. All right, have time for it, make time for it because it's faster. Those resources took hardly any time to build and it's laser focused and it's cheaper, all right? I'm going to put up one slide because I know I want to, uh, the other uh, Tobias is going to come on shortly. My very, very high level how to do this, uh, it might be more of like you want to take a quick picture of it if you want. I'm not going to talk through it. But basically, find your pain point. Once you've identified what's in addressing, find out when they need it. When's that friction happening? Is it happening on day one, week one, month one? Get the people who know it. Someone in the organization that has a question, someone else has answered that before. Find out who those people are and unpack it and build it as resources. And finally, experiment and scale what works. I don't know where you work, what you do, but for me right now, working in restaurants, I can try something in one site, see if it moves the dial, see if it works, and then expand it from there. Don't do big bangs. If you make big bets with big bangs, it doesn't usually work. So there's my wrap up. Hopefully it's been useful. That's my journey of performance support. I'm gonna pass over to Tobias now to uh, take the second half of this talk. Thank you very much. So uh, thanks, Adam, but the first thing I need to correct is um, this is not the last session of the day because I saw there is another session at 5 o'clock. So um, there is some opportunity, and I really appreciate you are here. So I'm going to spend around 20 minutes. Um, my name is Tobias Quetina. I currently work as head of learning solutions for V Group. V Group is a maritime ship management company. What I'm talking about is my previous time, five years in South Korea. Obviously now in ship management, I have some other problems such as the coronavirus and there is no internet on any vessel right now. So let me talk about something that I experienced. Um, now I'm working basically for a company that demands learning from other companies called Wenders. Previously I used to work for an outsourcing company called Raytheon. Uh, for 12 years, and I was on the other side, so now I'm happy to receive your business proposals. So what I did in Korea is I set up a business unit for Chevrolet, which you may have here as Vauxhall, and I developed training from scratch, so I set up a system. So something good to know about South Korea is it's all about content, and I know that Donald Taylor doesn't like that because I have rephrased his statement a little bit, its courses are abundant, time is rare, and there is a high competition. And I guess high competition, that's all around the world, but something to keep in mind for Korea is 70% of the 
of all Koreans have a university degree. And those guys, they don't work in the most um, prestigious jobs. They may work just at a normal point of sale, so in a supermarket. It's just how the country works. So what you see here is a reel of items that we have done in Korea. And it shows a little bit of the colorfulness of diverse content that we developed. When I started in Korea, and this is something that you will hear nearly every day, people are telling you, you need to do something different. What you have done was wrong. You need to do non-conservative training. You need to do more informal training. What I did in Korea is, I first set up a standard curriculum and standard formal training. I did workshops, OGT learning, to build the foundation. But later, and I think that's something to share with you, and that's the lesson learned that we have to do in learning and development, we evolved. The reason why is because the people were certified, they were selling the cars, they followed the standard procedures, but we had to add a little bit more. So what we did is we increased the interactions. And there's a simple question that you can ask yourself. How many interactions do you have with your learners every day? And the answer is for most, not that many, because the learning happens when you launch a new course and then to push people through because they have to complete their course. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to give people content nearly every day. So how did we, did that? How did we do that? We used SMS and chat newsletters. And, and one interesting thing is the penetration rate of a tool called Kakao Talk in Korea, which is the equivalent to WhatsApp in other countries, is 100%. Means everybody has that application installed. And the reason why is because they don't like WhatsApp. And they want to use their own Korean uh, applications. So we broadcasted and pushed the contents to their phone so they can use the content and consume the content whenever they have time to do it. I, I don't know who of you have been in Korea um, or in Japan or in Hong Kong, probably not recently, but when you have been there in the past, it's a little bit tricky to survive when you walk around because it's quite hectic. The 24 hours continuous traffic, if you look at Seoul, it's a 25 million uh, village city, better to say. So we wanted to give them as much content that they consume when they want, which you see here, is not 100% the standard learning and development that you have developed in the past or may develop in the future. For example, chat rooms and forums, that's something that normally um, you wouldn't start to develop. So let's look back into classic L&D, where I'm coming from. Um, compliance is key. In my current job, we need to make sure that we are compliant. And we need to show that everybody completed the course. Still, that number shows only one thing, that the people have done something. But I feel there's still for many, many conservative companies and for many, many businesses, it's the key to demonstrate that. Because you want to have an activity. For the classroom in Korea, that only meant if you are in a classroom for a day, you can't sell something or you can't do anything because you're in the classroom. And the conservative thinking was, don't send that guy to an instructor-based training because then he can't do anything. So it puts people away from work. They need to travel. They don't have continuous learning. And the Koreans, and maybe you, have done that in the past. You then switch to do a lot of e-learning, and then blended learning came up. So that's a little bit um, a summary of the learner-centric model that hopefully all of you have enabled within the company. And, and you can see there is a lot of diverse content here, and I'm not saying you need to do all of this. My message is always select the right content for your industry and for your business, and select what you need to get the performance and the performance support. So here we have advanced media, virtual classroom training, so, so many different things. And some of you may say, oh, wow, that's, do I need to do that? No, you don't need to do that, but you need to choose the right content wisely. And I made that learner-centric environment because the learner should be 
in the center of whatever you do as an activity. So when I went to Korea, I had to think about how does the learner environment look like? How do the people go to work, for example, commute? How much time do they spend? And what content do I need to build around that? So what is weekly or what is a daily performance support? Sorry. What is a daily performance support that we offered? First of all, it's culturally tailored content. And for those who don't work only in Europe, this may be interesting. When you develop content and you have global business, you must focus on the differences in probably every country. Because when you see um, a chat application called WhatsApp, and you want to utilize that for learning, it may be blocked in some countries. In other countries, it's not even known. So a couple of things that I put here on this slide are a couple of ideas that you could think about. And when you walk around here through the exhibition, there may be either companies offering you everything, or there may be companies that offer you one piece. It's up to you to decide um, what you choose. Um, can be podcasts, interactive PDFs, learning nuggets, interactive videos. So there are so many things around. And I want to emphasize you to look a little bit more at the journey of the learner. So every learner has a kind of lifestyle. And, and for me, my journey is I walk to work 30 minutes. What I do during that time, I usually have a conference call with one of my team members being located in Asia. I'm on the phone, I would say, almost two, three hours. My phone is always with me. I have a laptop, definitely, like you have, and I have some after work life. So ask yourself, how do your people spend their time these days? On, on the way to work is something that I recognize. I don't know how, how that is in in your city, in your country, where you are from. But there was a time 10 years ago when people read a book. And there was a time when people spoke to each other and had a conversation. Now, literally, I think everybody is on the phone watching Netflix, listening. OK, watching Netflix, not in London subway, because there is no internet. But um, obviously, there are tons of opportunities to focus on things that you can use during the time you are on the way to work. And what we did is we just utilized that time and gave opportunity to provide content in the same format that you use anyway. Yeah, we didn't put anything on Netflix, but we made podcasts. Why? Because they are portable and you can take them on their phone. And I always hear from, let's say, finance uh, companies, oh, we can't do that because it's all um, confidential content, and we don't want people to have that on their phone, on their private device. That's the reason why they can only do it on the laptop in the office in a secure environment. And I do understand that, but there are many other opportunities that you can approach by looking at the learner and the learner's journey. So. How to support colleagues? I think Adam has already mentioned a couple of examples from his business. And I have three items here on the slide. Create meaning and purposeful content. So what I experienced here for a couple of hours when I walk around, everybody wants to sell me something new. You need to do this now. But the point is, it's very simple to select the latest tool. You need to think about what's the latest content in the context that you use that addresses current real life problems. And when I'm talking about current real life problems, that's not about the private problems that you have. It's about the problems that your guys have when they work. And it's up to learning and development to identify that. So it must be job specific and relevant, and it must address problems that the people have at that time. So if I do a compliance training which focuses on ethics, that tells me I could buy a bottle of champagne for one of my vendors or not, 
then when I think about the Christmas time and I've done the course six months ago, I can't even remember what was the value in the UK that is allowed to be expensed. And last but not least, you need to make that content easy to find. What I experienced is on classic learning management systems, yeah, you can look for the course title, wonderful. But are you able to find the content that you need at the time when you need it in the most simplified way? So what we did in Korea is we just used predictive search engines that is through Processor working in the background, preparing it like Google. And why like Google? Because obviously it works. And that principle can just be transferred to everyday life. I've asked a question at the beginning, how many interactions do you have? And is there anybody here in the room who has 220 interactions per year, means 220 working days? How many opportunities do you take to be in touch with your people in regards to learning? And for me, performance support is, I'm a big fan of all the classic learning, and I find it super important to bring a structure into any organization. But the most important thing is, do you really provide that content availability every day when the people need it? For example, newsletters. It's a simple tool. Why do sales companies send us newsletters? Do you do that in learning and development? Do you share colleague ideas? I have learned most of the things from other people because they have greater ideas than me, and that's only because they probably have a different viewpoint. And that's something that I want to emphasize here in the room. Try to find the people in your company and try to utilize them for your own performance support. So when you, when you go through the exhibition, they will approach you with tools it's good, but you need to bring in the idea of knowing your company and knowing your company culture and your people to utilize those tools to bring them into performance support. So what are the best tools and what do they cost? It's a little bit provocative. I think most of the content and many of the tools could be almost free of charge. Content from your own people, best practice sharing, Adam has showed that. It's free. OK, you need to produce it. But we have learned in the morning through video production, the iPhone has such a good quality, you can ask your people to produce their own content. Of course, you need to guide them, because you don't want to share any crazy idea that somebody has. But you want to give the opportunities that people develop that engagement and collaboration. So 50% of the content that you can start with, you already have it. Why? Well, if you are in, in a sales company, you obviously have a catalog for a customer. So you can put them some augmented reality, some additional PDF interactivity into it. So what the customer sees will be additioned with information that your learner in the sales department has. So you need to find a clever learning and development guy who needs to find the right content and utilize it in a way because that will save significant costs. And even vendors, I learned when I walked around, I have that smaller company here, Bridge LT, they have a new platform called mLearn, where if you have a smaller amount of users, you can publish content almost free of charge. So there are tons of opportunities, but you need to look deeply into content because the tools are widely available. So how to deliver? It's a classic question. And everybody of you, everybody will have a web page, I assume, web presence of the company. And they usually have content management systems behind, such as Drupal or WordPress. I mean, some of your uh, kids may have their own WordPress site. And it could look cooler than any company site on this planet right now, because it's so easy and, and so intuitive to develop. So we did the same in Korea. We basically published content in a kind of Facebook style, using a content management system, uh, using different curation feeds so that people get content from external, which is relevant to them. And this is something very simple. Like, do you have wikis and how-tos? And do you ask employees to publish something that they have experienced very well and want to share? 
um, think about it. So the most important for me, apart from clever content and meaning and purposeful content is that you make sure people know how to find it. I know everybody in any company knows so many things, but it's the way to release that potential from the heads and put it into a system so others can benefit because the biggest capital around the world is knowledge and people. In L&D, we are very good in developing courses because we believe they will help. But many of our learners, they could know better than us. We just need to utilize that. So when we did this tool with the predictive search and, and we launched it, people typed in what they are looking for and they didn't find it. So what did we do with that data? We analyzed how many people were looking for it and then we discussed whether we should publish content for that. So that's the same principle that Google is doing, except Google gives you a thousand results, and then you need to make a decision, what's the right link I click on? And this is something that I want to emphasize as well. When you provide this kind of performance support content, make the search and the access easy to search for and available. Nothing happens, good. So if you want to go big, and I'm not promoting any company here, of course, um, in my current role in WeGroup, we are working with big companies in the UK and around the world to provide technology. So some of you may know WalkMe. I'm not sure whether they are here but they are a good example of how you can provide some guidance to software. And then there is learning pool with their stream LXP, something that's integrated in Teams. So that's additional performance support. And that, these are just examples. I'm not getting any additional payment from these companies. It's just about when you walk around here, ask for what do companies offers, and keep in mind to tell those vendors what you need because otherwise you may get a tool, but it's meaningless if you don't understand how you can utilize it within your company. So evaluating performance support tools and tailoring their use. What are my takeaways? Start with anything that is relevant. So I'm not giving the 100% manual here on how you can be successful, but take something that you have and add existing information. And you will be surprised how people start to utilize that and how much information you have within the company that you can utilize for performance support. Then be agile. Start with performance support and deliver bite-sized content rather than long courses. I'm a big fan of delivering you a bit every day. And you choose whether you want to do that. It's not, I'm not interested in you completed a course with a certain result because you had to do it. I'm interested in whether you used it and watched it because you thought it's meaning and purposeful, and I'm going to analyze that. That's the same principle that YouTube and Instagram and Facebook are using. And then listen to your users and listen to your learners. Why are Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram successful? And what content is popular? I've now recognized Instagram is becoming a sales tool. Is it becoming a learning tool as well? That's probably something we need to think about. So my message is try new things out that you haven't thought about, and they don't need to be L&D specific, but they need to fit in the journey of the learner and in the daily life, and then see what happens. So what data do you need? It's a good uh, question. For me, the most important thing is to understand what people are looking for and what they need in their job. And then look into how you deliver information across the group. I've seen in many companies, L&D departments deliver information to specific people because departments have created a needs training needs requirement, but they don't deliver it across the group. So try to get your information to a broader audience 
so people can utilize it and give you feedback how it works. Then get the Facebook principle, connect and share. Most of the content I have given in, I've been given in Korea and I have developed and utilized were coming from the user because somebody in the network had a good idea that I could discuss with the sales director, utilize and share with others. That's the principle of life, sharing and caring and utilizing knowledge of other people. And then start understanding where your gaps are. And, and that's back to the classical thing. Do a mystery shopping, look at your net promoter score, and look at the motivation of people when it comes to content, and look into the reality of what's the outcome of what you produce. Thank you so much. And I think we can now go to the panel discussion. Thank you. Adam, you want to? Any questions? Please don't be your first question right at the back. You always is. Oh, come on, you must have a question there. Yeah, right at the back. Jolly good. Right, OK, hang on. I'm going to come and push this microphone underneath your face. Speak nice and closely, and then everybody can hear what you have to say. And the next person, of course, will be at the front. Um, how do you connect uh, the performance outcome to the performance support that people had? So do you measure uh, if their performance is getting better by the performance support they used? Yeah, I mean, in standard learning and development, when we look at the Kirkpatrick analysis, the four levels, it's always difficult, right? I understand every department wants to see. The thing is, you, I think you need to measure it in a different way. Is it like... Have you sold more items? Have we sold more items due to our uh, training and due to our performance support? Difficult to measure because other departments will say, no, that's because of marketing or trends and so on. I think what you have to do is that mystery shopping, and that's for sales, but in customer care and other areas, it will work as well. You need to ask specific questions that, questions that refer back to your performance support. And I think that's the same thing that we do when we do classroom training. Um, we need to ask the right questions to understand whether our support has done an, an increase of competence, for example, or whether it's any other factor. But to summarize, always difficult to measure that with a justification of that's the only thing that made that better or worse? Um, I've, I've, my point on that is, I think one of the last slides I had was just like focus on real problems. And I think that when someone comes to you and says like, I want a course for this or a course for that, f focus on the evidence that exists like that suggests it is a problem you need to solve, but by understanding the data. I think that's really, really key for anyone. Like, I know that there's been a lot of data conversations and probably a few talks, but I think that understanding the real problem starts with understanding what data you can get your hands on and where are people failing, and then understand, okay, how can we move that up or down based on you know, whatever you're trying to achieve with performance support. So I think it's like, for me, understanding real problems, but only, only understand what's actually going on by, you know, asking for evidence that that's actually a problem in the organization. Who's next? There's got to be another question out there somewhere. Come on, people. This is my, this is my job. Come on, give me something to do. Run up and down the room. Somebody must have another question. Or are you all just desperate for the drinks reception? Is that actually what we're talking about? There we go. Well done. Right at the front. Thank you both for your presentation. Obviously, I'm familiar with the concept. Um, I'd like to get your views as to how you would turn cynics around with this approach because it's not the classroom, so, and many consider the classroom to be king. So there's a question, how do, how do you turn it around? I think that, that at ASOS and that example, classroom was still going on. Um, so it wasn't like it just that, that approach just kicked in and everything was abandoned. I think it was just trying to do something outside, do it off-piste and experiment with it and then show your stakeholders that there is a different way. Because I think in some cases, the people, a lot of our problems are compounded by people that demand training, like away days and courses, et cetera. And it's, 
it makes our, problem, um, our, our jobs even harder because we're like, okay, right, even if I didn't want to run training, this guy wants me to run training because that's what they've always had. It's a legacy problem, I think. Um, so I, I guess for me is show, if you have a problem or an issue that you're trying to solve, let's say, for example, it's new hires, okay, show there's a different way that doesn't involve people being in the room. And then I guess it's in showcasing that with evidence that a different way can still help, really. I think that would be my example. For me, it's hire clever people in L&D. Um, I've seen in the past, and don't get me wrong, I mean, seniority is important, but you need to create diversity in your departments. If you hire people who are into blogging and understanding things that are popular that we struggle to understand, you need to bring in some new intelligence into your departments to support you. Because if you run that performance support, the key is the content itself. That requires somebody who understands learning and development, but it also requires somebody who understands what does need to be developed and delivered. And, and that's for me, in learning and development departments, it's always with the people in your department. Anyone else? Look at this. Sea of people trying not to make eye contact with me whatsoever. Well, if that's all we have for this afternoon, I just want to thank both Adam and Tobias for their fabulous talk this afternoon. Thank you all very much for coming along as well. We're not running away, so if you actually did want to answer a question but you just didn't want to use the microphone, then feel free to come up and have a chat. Thank you very much indeed. Enjoy the drinks reception.